and she is a data engineer working at LinkedIn. Good luck, Dana. Thank you. Uh, so thank you for the organizers and uh, thank you for everyone for joining uh, this late and for choosing my track. Uh, I know there are many awesome uh, tracks going on right now at the same time, so thank you for joining this one and I hope it will be very informative for you. So um, this uh, webinar was initially intended as a, a workshop with uh, Pilot is Amsterdam and it was meant to be a bit longer, so around two hours, so I just compressed it a bit into a live demo and um, like a short introduction about serverless. Uh, if you don't know about PyLadies, that's a meetup group in Amsterdam and they organize awesome workshops, they provide uh, mentorship and um, also they welcome uh, Python users from different levels, so you can definitely join if you uh, want. So today I'm going to talk about, um, so this is, first of all, this is a session intended for complete beginners uh, and so people who have little to no prior experience with the cloud and um, uh, maybe with some experience with Python. So uh, you will need some basic Python knowledge to be able to follow the live coding part. And um, before I go on, I'm going to introduce myself uh, quickly. So uh, I'm Dana, I'm data engineer at Linkit. And uh, previously I have experience as a software engineer. Uh, I have some background in robotics uh, before I switched to data. And now my main interest is uh, providing solutions for data driven companies. And I'm interested in um, data intensive systems. So if you want to connect, uh, please do. Um, Aliona from PyLadies is uh, already joined the um, comment section. So she will be there to answer any questions. Uh, if you join via the meetup uh, group, you probably saw that there is some prior setup. Um, I will not cover that and I will not cover the entire workshop, but you're more than welcome to uh, send any questions you have later to me or to Leona and we'll be happy to answer them. So let's uh, go over first about what I'm going to cover today. So as I mentioned, I'm going to explain why you should be interested in cloud computing if you are uh, not using it already. Then I'm going to explain uh, what is cloud computing. After, I'm going to explain what is serverless, and for this, I'm going to use uh, a function as a service offering from Azure called uh, Azure Functions. Uh, I'm going to explain how you can use Azure Functions in Python, and finally, uh, I will explain how you can properly structure your Python code so you can use it in Azure Functions. And I'm going to have a demo for this, so you can see how easy it is to start with um, Azure Functions in Python and integrate your own code with them. So um, as I mentioned, there might be some complete beginners and people who are not familiar. So I'm going to start with very basic uh, introduction about why you should be interested about cloud computing. So imagine that you have an idea for some awesome application and you believe that this application will provide excellent user experience and it will generate a lot of profit for you. However, in order to be able to reach your target audience and to you know, make people use it and spread the word about it, you need to deploy it. So you need to find a way in which you can release it and the application needs to like reach a target audience. So to deploy an application, you need, first of all, specialized knowledge and you need a uh, appropriate developer group that will have this knowledge. But more, moreover, you need like appropriate infrastructure. So you need servers, you need databases, you need to think about security, etc. And um, uh, this in combination like uh, with all the hardware, you need to know how to set it up. So that requires a lot of specialized knowledge and it's a lot of checkboxes you need to take before you're able to deploy it. It's a lot of components and it seems like we need to care more about the infrastructure instead of the application itself and the developing. And this is what we care about as developers. So uh, what like we need to think if there is a way to simplify this process and only work on the code. So this is where cloud computing comes in. Um, and um, so, uh, sorry, uh, so uh, first of all, um, we need to understand why this is risky. So um, because we have um, to invest so much in advance, uh, we need to think about how like the initial setup, um, I'm sorry, I got a bit <laughs> nervous. Uh, so, 
uh, as I mentioned, like uh, we have the initial setup, like we need all the servers, we need we have all the hardware we need to uh, set up initially, and we need to think about um, initially how expensive this might be. So this means that if we think about the target audience, like what if you buy a big amount of servers and then um, you don't have the complete target audience you might have. So you made a huge advance uh, investment in advance, and this might not be um, this might not be um, like you might lose a lot of money in the end. So this is risky because you might create a big thing, big team in advance, and invest in a lot of servers, and in the end you might not get anything in return. So cloud computing offers an alternative to this in a way that you can um, you can uh, provide all the infrastructure for you instead of you buying all the servers in advance. So cloud computing is a platform that provides access to computing resources over the internet. This means that uh, you can access a lot of uh, computing resources uh, via the platform like Microsoft Azure. So uh, basically, um, you have, uh, I'm sorry, just a moment. I think uh, we're experiencing some experiencing some uh, Yana, welcome back. My uh, screen is freezing and I cannot see the slides I'm going uh, through next. So I'm just clicking, but the slides are not going uh, like they're not changing. OK. So I'm having a bit of uh, issues with that. Can you restart your uh, your PowerPoint? Yeah. Yeah, your app. Uh, just a moment. So I got like it's a bit difficult because I cannot follow the um, I prepared. At least no, on wor no worries. This is this is live uh, live uh, debugging the presentation, oh, yeah. which is. Uh, yeah. Which is awesome. So I can I can see it like this, but once and when I enter a full screen mode, I cannot see the slides changing for me after I. Uh, if it's, if this is very difficult for you, you can keep your screen this way as well. If that is easier for you, you can decide. Okay. Yeah, is that better? Um. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, I guess it's not as nice. I'm sorry no. about this. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Okay, Let's continue. Um, um, so, uh, as I mentioned previously, we so let's just recap. I think I wasn't super clear. So we have um, uh, risk when we are setting up our servers initially, and like we we're making the initial investments, is we cannot assume from start how much everything will cost. So we need a way to um, move the worry from thinking about the costs to uh, how we can only care about the code. So this is where cloud computing comes into play. And uh, as I mentioned previously, that's a platform that provides access to computing resources over the internet. So what does cloud computing can do for us? So first of all, it can provide us with data centers. So um, uh, basically, cloud providers have a lot of data centers in various uh, locations, and what this provides for you is um, uh, basically access to servers, computing power, storage, etc. Then we have a lot of services that uh, cloud providers provide for us. 
Uh, here we have like services like storage, um, and we, we can think about like different kinds of storage. Uh, then we have um, machine learning services or uh, basically data analysis, etc. And finally, the most important thing is that um, the cloud uh, computing uh, like providers provide cost effective way to run our applications. Basically, we only pay for what we use, which means that um, instead of thinking in advance and buying in advance servers and um, like scaling as uh, things progress, we only pay for the services we use and that's based on requests. So you only pay for what you use and you in that way, it's very easy to scale and reduce your costs. So let's look at the services that uh, uh, cloud computing providers uh, provide. So they offer um, AI and machine learning services. Then we have analytics, compute services. Um, here, like this is one of the services that we'll talk about later, Azure Functions. Uh, they provide containers, um, databases. Here we have like different kinds of databases, relational, non-relational, etc. Uh, we have migration services, so we can use a cloud provider to migrate from one database to another, uh, different networking uh, services and security. So what's Azure? I think all of you are already familiar, but for the complete beginners, this is a cloud provider that offers ever expanding set of uh, cloud computing services. And uh, we are going to talk mostly about uh, that today. So. Now, when we see what's the cloud, let's uh, think about like why would we need serverless? So serverless, it's uh, a way to run your um, application without caring about the infrastructure. So here, I mean that you don't have to care about basically uh, pitching your service, installing all the security, um, um, like security uh, dependencies, caring about your Python dependencies, and et cetera. So I'm not saying this is not valuable work, but instead of, um, Caring too much about um, like doing all of that, you can provision it, and this provides a lot of value for um, you as a, a developer because you can focus more on the KPIs and focus more on the code you're developing instead of the infrastructure. So Azure Functions is a way you can run um, this kind of like serverless computing, uh, serverless functions uh, like in the server uh, in the cloud online. Uh, so that's um, a way to run event triggered code without having to explicitly provision or manage infrastructure. So you can think of Azure functions as a code in combinations with events and data. So this means that you write your code and then you're waiting for certain trigger or an outside event to start it. Uh, so this is kind of a mind shift. So instead of thinking about um, the code as you're writing it, you uh, think about the function you're creating and then you have a certain event that needs to trigger it. So imagine that you have, um, let's say, a blob storage and you have an image storage inside. So you are waiting for basically a new image to be upload, uploaded and then this will result in your function getting triggered and doing some computation. Uh, other types of triggers can be um, uh, basically sending an HTTP request, maybe a user login or um, like a new row in a database or like some kind of bit shop. And after this, this will trigger uh, the code to be uh, sent to a database or uh, some kind of output, like we need to glue our function with another services. So basically what we can do is uh, send the output from the functions to like, for example, to another service like a database or use it in a machine learning project, et cetera. So what we can like sum up from all of this is that Azure Functions provide a really easy way to build applications using serverless functions. And we can manage our applications instead of our infrastructure and spend more productive time as developers. So Azure Functions offer like choice of language, so we can use different kinds of languages like um, Python, JavaScript, etc. As I mentioned previously, they follow the pay per use pricing model. So uh, you basically only pay for the time when the function is running and you don't care about um, all the like, you don't care like whether you have any hidden costs while the function is idle or not running. You can use the dependencies you use in your Python project so far. So that's um, uh, like an added benefit. You don't have to restructure your code additionally. All the dependencies 
you're using in Python, you can easily use them in your uh, Azure function as well. And I'm going to show you how you can do that. Uh, it has already some integrated security, so it also saves you up some time on data side as well. It also offers a really easy integration that I showed previously with other services. So if you looked in like the previous graph when I showed the event-driven architecture, you can uh, very easily glue different services with your Azure functions as an input and as an output. So you have a big choice of events you can use to start your function, and then you can really, really easily uh, use that output, like the thing that the function is uh, computing, into a um, different service in Azure. So I don't know, load it in a database, uh, store it into blob storage, use it for your machine learning models, um, like I don't know, a, lo a lot of different things you can do with it. Uh, it offers really flexible way of development and deployment. Uh, part of the workshop is about deployment, so it's really easy to deploy your uh, function in the end after you develop locally. So you can look at that as well. And finally, it's open source, so you can uh, like look at the repository and like play with it a bit. Um, so I'm going to talk shortly about what are the potential applications, uh, like great applications for Azure functions. So they're really, really good for uh, processing data. Why? Because um, you can easily trigger uh, an event that can get the data from somewhere, then do some transformation, and finally load it somewhere. It's really, really easy to um, uh, glue this thing together. Then it's really nice for integrating systems. Uh, I'm going to show a bit later with, with the way, like, because they support nice triggers and bindings. It's good for working with IoT, uh, creating simple APIs and microservices. Um, so Azure Functions support, as I mentioned previously, triggers. That's the way that you start the execution. That's what tells your function that it needs to start running. Um, and they also support bindings. So in uh, Azure Function terms, that's a way to simplify the input and the output of the data into the function. So now let's look shortly in the types of triggers and bindings Azure, Azure Function support. Uh, as triggers, or as I mentioned previously, the way you tell the function it needs to start running, it supports, um, basically, it can detect events in blob storage, different HTTP requests, um, events in GitHub, etc. And we can glue our functions, like we can use the input and the output from different tables, uh, I don't know, the, the document DB, for example, other like relational databases, uh, queue, etc. So, Azure Functions were released in 2016, but they didn't have Python support until 2019. So this is a very recent development uh, and uh, like really welcome one. It's a uh, like nice addition. So um, Azure, so I'm going to talk about a, little bit, a bit now about how we can use Azure Functions in Python, like what are the best practices. So all that I'm focusing on Python, this is not uh, only um, like applicable to uh, Python. You can uh, like apply these principles and these practices to other languages as well, because some of them are just common sense. So let's dive a bit like uh, into that. So uh, first of all, when you write Azure functions, you like very like simple one, you need to have reasonable name for a function. So let's look at this one, like it not really tells, doesn't really tell us, uh, tells us anything and we need to um, know that the function will be used by other developers as well. So instead of saying something like get max d from data frame, it's better to make it clear like what the function is getting and then you can specify the like what's the input in the arguments. Uh, the function needs to have a single responsibility. So when you're using Azure functions, you need to keep in mind that the function has only limited running time. So the default one is around five minutes and it cannot run long, longer than that. So if you write really, really long functions, you need to be aware that like it might not be able to finish in time. So if you write a nice function, like short function that has a single responsibility, you in the same time, you can make sure that the function will not run longer than it's supposed to. So if you look something like this, like uh, this is not a good practice. Why? Because the function is doing more than one thing. So it's always a good thing to separate responsibility and have one function per one thing that needs to be done. So related with the previous point, the function should be very short and readable. So uh, there are some red flags you can uh, look at here. You, when you look at the function, like for the first time, you should be immediately able to determine what's the function purpose. If you're not able to do that, 
that probably means that there is like the function it should be like shortened and made like be made more readable. If the function contains uh, really deeply nested control structures, that means that um, like something is wrong. Like the logic should be as simple as possible, and you should try to uh, focus on making the function like a bit more. Uh, so it shouldn't be too like it can be complex if there is a necessity, but uh, you should always try to simplify the logic as much as possible. So. You should also be uh, very aware that the logic shouldn't be duplicated in other methods. So uh, we should always uh, like check whether the code like is repeated somewhere else. Also, like if your massive grade developer display is not big enough to display the function, that probably means that you're doing something wrong and you should make it shorter. Uh, the function should be idempotent. So this means that uh, every uh, input that you're getting, every input event you're getting, uh, you must identify whether it was processed before or not. So let's look at a simple scenario. So we have blob storage that triggers an Azure function, and this uh, Azure function writes after that into databases. So uh, we need to think about this possible scenario, like what will happen if one of these um, two cases like fails. So what if we successfully write the first database, but we fail to the write, fail to write to the second database? So one is the thing to do is to just like restart the process. However, we're risking um, the possibility for um, creating a duplicate, right? What will happen uh, if we try to write the same entry to the first database again? That means that uh, we might like create a duplicate row. So we need a way to prevent uh, duplicate rows from be being created. So there is a way we can do that. First of all, like we need to extract a unique attribute from like the output we are generating from the Azure functions, like think about some transaction ID. Then we can quickly check whether the, this attribute already exists in the control database. And then if it does, we can just terminate the execution and like uh, stop uh, the whole thing. And if it doesn't, we uh, can continue the execution normally and then write the row that was missing into the database. Um, when whether the function finishes successfully, we should include the record in the control database so we can protect ourselves from like future failures like this and then finally finish the execution. Um, as mentioned previously, the function should finish as quickly as possible because Azure functions have a time limit about how long the function can run. So if it runs longer, like the uh, execution will be terminated. So you need to closely monitor how long your function is running. Then uh, if you're using recursions, like you need to be careful with it because you might end up in an infinite loop. So try to either set up the depth of the recursion and monitor how long the function is running or completely avoid recursions. Uh, then the function should be stateless. So what does this mean? First of all, you cannot control where and when uh, function instances are provisioned or deprovisioned. So there is no way to store data within the process between requests reliably. Uh, if you want, you can uh, utilize external storage, but this is something you need to like, keep in mind. Uh, also, like common sense, you need to include a doc string for other developers so it's easy for them to follow what's uh, like happening in your code base. And when you're writing a function, you should always think about writing defensive functions. This means that you should always assume that errors are going to rise. Uh, use assertions, which means that you can like quickly check whether the code is producing like the correct input and output. Then use preconditions to check that the inputs uh, of the function are safe to use. And finally, you should use post conditions to check that the output from a function is safe to use, meaning like you need to check whether it is safe to propagate the output to like other services. And finally, a good practice is to write tests before you write code. Uh, in this way, you can like take in advance about the logic of um, the code you're trying to write, and also like test all the functionality in advice. And like finally, uh, I don't think it's like necessary to say, but still see it from time to time. Please don't hard code secrets. There are a way you can handle this, like either with environment variables or people, for example. Uh, but definitely don't leave it in your code. Um, so what do you need to consider before uh, deciding whether you want to move your application uh, to become like serverless? First of all, you should be aware that serverless is not right for every project, especially if you want like complete control over things. Uh, 
Uh, also, like if your workloads are constant, then it's probably not a good idea to use serverless. Serverless is awesome when you have um, basically changing workloads. So let's say you have periods of very high activity uh, and then followed by a period with like not so high activity. This means that you will get like really low bill for the time when the um, function is not running and like it will scale automatically when you have higher workload with more users. If your work workloads are constant, then probably serverless is not necessary for your project. If you have very long running functions, then no, you cannot use Azure functions because you have a time limit, um, uh, like the maximum amount of time which your function can run. And you also need to check the supported languages. For example, Python was not supported re until recently, so it should be one of the ones you are familiar with and it's also supported. Uh, then you should structure your code for following best practices and you should optimize your code for the billing model. So you're sure that really your um, application will be um, as low cost as possible. Finally, lock everything. Like it will be really helpful for like you will do yourself a favor, it will be really easy to figure out what went wrong uh, once something goes wrong, and it will. <laughs> so let's uh, jump into the workshop. Let's see how we can create a simple serverless function. Uh, I'm going to quickly switch my uh, screen to the terminal, and let's hope everything goes OK. Um, OK, so. Um, as I mentioned previously, so this live demo is part of the workshop I created with Pilotis Amsterdam. I'm just going to cover a part of it, and then you're more than welcome to jump to the GitHub repository, uh, look at uh, like the entire workshop. You can go through it, uh, send any questions if they arise, and you're also more than welcome to contribute. Uh, so for this uh, demo, I already created um, a simple a simple project uh, that does some basic natural language processing. But before we do that, I'm going to just show you how easy it is to create an Azure function using your terminal. I decided to use the terminal because I already found a lot of tutorials about how you can do it with, for example, Visual Studio Code or um, like the Azure portal itself. And uh, I decided to do it like this just so you can easily like find a reference for it as well. So to start with this, you will need a free subscription to Azure, uh, to Azure portal. You can get it very easily. It's explained in the workshop. And like, if you any, have any trouble, just let me know. So let's uh, go through it. So I'm going to um, create initially like a simple template for my project. OK, as you can see now, um, just a moment. I'm sorry, it's not responsive. Uh, I'm going to choose the language I'm planning to use. In my case, this is uh, Python. And it will generate a template for me. Um, so if you got this, then you're fine. This means that the project was installed successfully. If you do LS, now we can see that the project template was created. So uh, let's generate some uh, Buller plate code to kickstart our uh, error functions. So I'm just going to CD into the new project I created, and I'm going to create a new function. Uh, here we can uh, choose uh, the template we're going to use. In this case, I'm going to use a simple HTTP trigger. Uh, and maybe like other triggers could be another like nice idea for another workshop. Now we need to specify the um, uh, function name. So I'm going to call it response text processing. Uh, and we can see that the function was created successfully from the HTTP trigger template. So this means that uh, the project and the function were installed uh, successfully. So it, it's, it's easy as this to create your uh, first Azure function, and you can already test and see what the HTTP uh, trigger template does. So um, you can start, um, you can first see what was generated. We can see that we uh, got like a host file uh, and the requirements file. So the requirements file is the file that contains all the uh, modules or the libraries you're using in Python, and you can easily use pip to install everything and then just freeze all the requirements there. 
Uh, the local settings JSON file contains all the local settings. So for now, we are testing everything locally, but it's really easy to deploy the function to the Azure portal as well. And finally, we have the host JSON file, which contains like the settings for the host. So let's start the function locally. So now you can see the function running. And in the end, it will give you the um, IP address with the request you can use for it. So I'm now I'm going to quickly switch to Postman so I can show you how response would look like. OK. So now I'm in Postman. And here I have the IP address, which we saw previously in the terminal. And if we. So just a second, we need to pass a um, uh, parameter. In my case, this is a name. So we can do that Oops. super quickly. You can type your name here. And then if you do the pass request, a post request, it will like return a reply for you. So OK, uh, this is a very, very simple Azure function that just takes a name, a string, as an input parameter and returns like another string which says hello plus the name. So let's uh, close the terminal for now and let's look how we can use a function that you already created previously in um, um, like it's an Azure function. So as I mentioned previously, I already wrote uh, some code and it's uh, stored here. So here I have a simple text processing file and I want to basically deploy some of the functions in this file. It's an Azure function. So to do that, um, just a second. The terminal was not screened. OK, so uh, as I mentioned previously, I have, I, because I didn't share the screen, I have a file I created. And this file um, contains uh, the code that we want to deploy in our case. So you can look at the details. It contains basically some very simple uh, natural language processing uh, methods. And we want to uh, deploy uh, this. So the input of this file is um, um, a text file. And the text file gets clean from like all the punctuation or like, um, like words that are too common, like and or I. And then we want to basically extract the sentiment through it. I already installed all the requirements in it for this, so I'm not going to go through that. So I, for example, use NumPy. You can really easily install it using pip install, and then um, uh, you can just pip use pip freeze to um, store all the requirements in the text file. So when you deploy your Azure functions to, like, to the cloud, uh, all the requirements will be packaged together and like installed there. So let's... Um, move the file I created to um, the function Python HTTP example I really created. Oops, sorry. OK, so basically the code you want to use, it should be inside the uh, template project you created. Uh, you can look at the structure. It's explained very well into the Azure documentation. Then you want to edit the um, init file that was generated for us. Uh, that's also like explained into more details into the um, like the readme file that's on the workshop on the GitHub page. Um, so I'm going to do it quickly. So I'm going to get here and I'm going to open the init file and it its contents really quickly. Uh, so basically, the only change I did is I changed uh, the input it's getting, like when it's making a post request, instead of only accepting text uh, and like returning a text out, now I'm accepting the whole file and I'm returning the process text, the tokens it extracted, and some entities. So um, 
now we can start our function in a very similar way as we did before. So just going to go one. Um, and start the function. So we can see it's running. So now we have a different IP address from the like, like we have the same IP address from the one I created previously, but like the output should be edited. I still have the same uh, get and post methods because I didn't edit that part. So if we go back uh, to Postman, now we should be uh, able to see that we can input a simple data file and um, use um, use uh, like that to get an output to um, like the entities, the tokens, and the like edited output. So I'm gonna switch very quickly to Postman again. I cannot see it in just a moment. I'm sorry for all the technical <laughs> difficulties. Um, OK, there it is. OK, so we're back to Postman. And now, as you can see, I have a um, um, text file as an input instead of like previously, I didn't have nothing in the previous uh, request. Uh, so we're going to use this simple data file as an input to our um, like Azure function. And as an output, we should see um, the uh, basically the text. Like this is just uh, the input we're giving. So um, and some of the tokens it extracted. So it's like really easy. I can open and um, so I'm going to terminate this for now. And I'm going to go into the um, response text file and I'm going to open the init.py. So as you can see, all you have to do is import the code you're using. So basically the code you created and then you just need to edit the file that was generated for you initially and just specify what the output you want uh, to be. So in this case, we are returning a JSON and we're turning these three things. OK, so um, it I uh, finished a bit sooner than I expected. I can uh, share the link with you. So there is one final part. The final part is uh, like in this workshop is how you can um, deploy this simple application we created to um, like the Azure Cloud. And also there is another part where you can uh, see how uh, you can properly, like there is a bit messy Python file and you can see how you can properly like refactor it with, like following the steps I already mentioned during the presentation. Okay, so thank you and sorry for all the uh, technical issues. Uh. Okay, Dana, thank you. I do have a couple of questions for you. Uh, the first one is from Mark. from Mark. He says that he has a .NET background, but mm -hmm. he would love to try functions in Python. Um, are the official Azure documentation around uh, Python, is that up to date? Yeah, it's really good as well. I think it's really awesome and uh, like very well prepared. Uh, for complete beginners, like if you just if you're just starting with Python, if you're just starting with cloud computing, it might be a bit overwhelming, like with too much information. So that was the purpose of this workshop, kind of like to you know condense everything into one place where you can easily start. But if you have a lot of experience with .NET, I think you can really easily uh, start with like just using Python. Okay, and the link on the screen right now that you're yeah, uh, uh, is that the uh, workshop link? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Dana, for this uh, for this talk on uh, on serverless <coughs> functions, uh, Python edition. <laughs> um, I think it's really good to get started with uh, with the workshop. Uh, it's uh, it's looking good. So I'm also uh, tempted to to, uh, to go ahead with uh, with that. Uh, so thank you very much, um, and for you all viewers, thank you very much for uh, with us uh, um, from uh, one o'clock uh, uh, this uh, this afternoon till uh, till now. We had a lot of fun enjoying all those uh, community talks. 
Um, we really missed it uh, to to hang out together, um, and I think it was uh, it was very much fun uh, together. Um, thank you all uh, who watched for all the interactions as well. There was a lot of questions uh, on the chats and uh, on uh, on uh, on Twitter. So thank you for that, and of course all speakers. Um, given all the interactions, it was much appreciated. It's very difficult to. Uh, give a, a, a talk when uh, nobody is uh, in the room except uh, your eight-year-old or your uh, or your cat. Um, so it's highly appreciated. Um, all communities, uh, meetups, helping putting uh, putting this together. Um, we're hoping to do this uh, very soon uh, again. So uh, we hope we can uh, can count on you again uh, uh, at uh, at that uh, at that time. Uh, and of course. Thank you all hosts uh, for today's Shout uh, Zaal uh, for, uh, for being a host. And of course, major thanks to our director, producer and all over hero, Hank Boelman, um, for, uh, for putting this all together. It's uh, sometimes stressful, uh, but, uh, but the result is, uh, is amazing. Um, so this concludes our uh, virtual Azure Community Day, the first one. Uh, hope to see you around for the next one. And uh, uh, thank you. And please don't forget to subscribe to the Microsoft.Source newsletter. We will put a link in the chat window. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon.